Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talk about? Well, I'm going to take a break from trading psychology. And believe me, I think trading psychology is the most important thing when it comes to trading. And we're going to pick up on that in a couple of weeks. And next week we'll do the mid-year update, which I'm going to refer to quite a bit in this presentation. But for now, I want to talk about my indicators because they're being released this weekend. And by the way, housekeeping, I do take requests. I am a little behind on the requests due to the amount of material that I have to cover, been having to cover lately. But this week we do have a quick question on money management. I'll get to that in just one second. If you'd reach me, DaveLeonard.com slash contact. If you want to get started with my methodology, go to DaveLeonard.com slash stock charts. And I will give you the slides from all of these presentations, which contain all the rules to the systems and setups I mentioned, and also some money management and psychology, of course, too. Hey, Dave, money management question for you. I binge watched every StockCharts.com episode of yours. Thank you. So you're the guy. Awesome stuff, but there is one thing you didn't answer. By the way, if I'm speaking in a seminar and 10, 11 people come up to me after the show, 10 of those people usually have questions about the setups and believe me i'm a setup junkie and, and i get it but there's usually one person who'll have a money management question so that one person if i had to bet who would make it i would say that one person would become a successful trader so anthony i'm betting on you buddy how much of your total brokerage account should be invested at a time the quick answer to that is it depends when you watch next week's mid-year update you're going to see that we were heavily invested if you want to call it that meaning that we had almost the entire portfolio in stocks. And then we ended up selling some of those longs as they stopped out. We had to put shorts on. But at one point, we ended up flat, meaning no position. So it all depends on the market condition and letting that ebb and flow control the portfolio. So watch next week's presentation, and I think that's going to shed some light on that. Also, I'm going to give you a link later in the show to the archives where you can go in and walk through my trading service archives and you can see for yourself how we go from no positions to quite a few positions back to no positions rinse and repeat say i have a 100k account if i have 10 stocks that i'm each risking two percent of my account on and each requires 10k investment do i invest in each and fully invest my account thanks anthony well the quick answer would be yes but keep in mind and again, watch next week's show, but the ebb and flow will control your portfolio because some days, let's say some days you have one or two stocks that are setting up, so you would buy those stocks if they trigger, but they might not trigger. So it might take you a long time to get up to 10 stocks, and hopefully over that period of time, you'll be taking some partial profits along the way. Now, the question that I initially thought Anthony was asking was if you're putting 2% in your account, you would invest $2,000 into each individual stock. But that wasn't his question. I was thinking $10,000 total. But let's cover that just real quick because it is a common question that I get quite a bit. So 2% risk on a $100,000 account is $2,000. You divide that by how much you're risking on a point basis if stopped out. Now that's gonna vary based on the price and the volatility of the stock. So in this case, we were close to a one point stop. And you can see that we bought or we we're looking to buy just over 2000 shares of stock. Now, if you go down a little bit, you can see we had a two point stop on this one. And we're only looking to buy 1000 shares of stock. So it's the amount you're willing to risk on a trade. And it should usually be no more than 2% and work up to that number, by the way and then divide that by the point stop. So again, one point you'd buy about 2,000 shares and two points you would buy much less. Now it just so happens that if you bought this amount of shares, 200 shares in this one case and then in the other case it would be closer to 1,100 shares, you would end up with roughly about 10K per position like Anthony suggested. but Keep in mind that that could vary quite a bit. So you could end up with a lot more margin in one position than another. So I just want to clarify some of these things quickly. And also, if you go back to the Chewy trade, which was a former mystery chart, by the way, 
you'll notice that we have $5,545 was the initial margin on that. But initially there was the second half of the position. So with the entire position on, you put up about 11 k in margin to buy the 260 shares. Now we take the shares and divide it to a trading loaf and a trending loaf. The trading loaf, we're looking to get a swing trade on and we're looking to make 1% on our account value. And that's why you notice where we've taken partial profits, the ones that aren't highlighted, it's somewhere around $1,000. Now, sometimes the market doesn't always allow us to get that exact $1,000 out based on 100K account, 1%, but that's a general idea. Now, in the case of the Chewy stock, you could see that what happened was we took off half those shares. So now we only have $5,545 initial margin that was put up in that particular position. So over time, the amounts in the portfolio, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully as we hit those profit targets, the share size gets reduced. Now, if you're watching this around the middle of July 2020, if you go to more trading lessons, and if you have a login, you'll be able to reach this, but this is free. But these latest articles do come and go, and they go behind the firewall, and every now and then I'll republish one of these or I'll add a new one in. But right now, go and read Understanding a Stock's Volatility, Better the devil you know, and explains a lot about margin management and stop placement along, along the lines of a more volatile stock with a wider stop, STOP, is actually less risky. But you can see here in this particular case, because the stop was at three points, you would buy 300, I'm sorry, 666 shares. And divide that to a trending loaf and a trading loaf. So round up or down, depending on whether you want to be a little less aggressive or a little more aggressive. And let's just say 600 shares round numbers. Now, you can see in this particular case, we did hit the initial profit target. And we're trailing a stop on the remainder. And notice that the second loaf of the position so far, knock on wood, is doing pretty, pretty well. We're up about 50% on that. Doesn't always happen, unfortunately. And as you can see here... This is a former mystery chart, 200 shares here and so far this trade is underwater. But we divide 100 shares or we divide the 200 shares into a trending loaf and a trading loaf. Now let's talk about my indicators. Dave Landry's stick with the trend indicators. Now before we get indicators, as I said in a prior show, you must remember that Indicators really don't indicate. They're more of illustrators. And price is the ultimate oscillator. What is, is. Now, keep in mind that an indicator derived from price does not predict. It just tells you what already has occurred. And that's why I call them illustrators sometimes because it illustrates what's already there. Sometimes I'll look at a chart and I'll think it's pretty bullish and then... I'll put in my bow tie moving averages, which we're going to discuss here in just one second. And then I realize, well, wait a minute, these things are beginning to roll over. They have rolled over. So this stock really hasn't done that well. But the fact that the moving average is rolling over, they're not predicting anything. They're just telling you that the stock could be losing steam. So speaking of bow ties, the bow tie moving averages, if you go back, and it was probably about my fifth show here at Trading Simplified for stock charts you'll get, get a little bit more information on how to trade the bow tie. But it's just a 10 simple moving average, a 20 exponential and a 30 exponential. And I've messed around with quite a few moving averages. And I found that the relationship between these moving averages is pretty cool, especially during market transitions. So if we take a look at the last sell signal we had here, notice that the bow ties came together, the bow tie moving averages came together and spread out to the downside. The market pulls back a little bit. And on May 5th, we triggered into a short in the S&P 500. Now, I didn't actually short the S&P 500. I took individual stock trades. But if you were trading the overall market, that would have been the day it triggered in on the 5th. Now, again, here's that signal. And notice that the bow tie moving averages had flipped over fairly quickly. Now, 
when the market rallied from its lows, it took a while for these moving averages to cross back over to get back to proper order. So I wouldn't call that a bow tie because it wasn't a nice and tight bow tie. The fulcrum didn't happen over, let's say, three or four or five days or three or four or five periods if you're looking at an intraday chart or a weekly chart. But rather, it took a couple of weeks on a daily chart for this to unfold. Also, this low was a fairly major low, but it wasn't like a multi, multi-year low. I prefer like five or maybe even 10-year lows and bow ties, especially in something like the indices. The bigger, the better, the longer, the better, I should say. And obviously, the one we had back in March was coming off of all-time highs. Now, if you want to see how we played this with the bow ties and individual issues, go to davelander.com slash archives. And of course, watch next week's mid-year update because that's going to show you the ebb and flow in the portfolio and how we went from being long to mostly short, or I should say mostly long, to mostly short to flat during this slide and subsequent rally. Now, the proper order of the bow ties, meaning that the 10 is greater than the 20 and the 20 is greater than 30 for uptrends, or the 30 is greater than the 20 and the 20 is greater than the 10 for downtrends, can be quite useful. So in this particular case, if it's green, it means they're in uptrend proper order. If it's red, it means they're in downtrend proper order. So I'm often asked to draw a line in the sand with the markets, and it's not quite that easy, but this is how I came up with Tarzan speed, good or bad. And if the moving averages are in uptrend proper order, Tarzan speak, that's good. And if they're in downtrend proper order, Tarzan speak, that's bad. I don't know why I sound like the Cookie Monster and not Tarzan. And here's one thing that's kind of cool about proper order. If they're kind of flipping back and forth in the way the programmer designed this for me is we decided to make it yellow if they're just kind of going back and forth. And that's kind of neutral, and you might want to just stay out of the market or not get too bullish or not get too bearish during those periods. And, of course, when things improve, as a general statement, you want to be long again. Now, if we take a long-term view of the market and we take a look at the weekly bow ties, you could see the proper order was up for a long long time there was a little tiny bit of red in there but for the most part it was up and some yellow mixed in between now on the downside you could see that we had a bear market here and it was mostly red mostly green for a bull market mostly red for a bear market and then mostly green for the uptrend that followed now there were a few periods of red in between and those times were really nothing to sneeze at and i'm gonna flesh those out in a few minutes but again green is good and red is bad and obviously we had a little recent spill where the bow tie moving averages on a weekly basis turned down and rolled over and then now they're in the process of turning back up and they just turn green again now landry light is a really simple indicator but it's something that's really, really, really cool. And Landry Light came, I'm going to date myself here. Landry Light comes from an article I wrote in 1995 for Stocks and Commodities. And back then I was noodling around a lot with the 20-day exponential moving average. And I, was, I sought out, I was seeking to prove that you could use a very simple system and trade something like the Japanese yen with nothing more than a moving average. And the prereq was that you had to have two bars of, initially was just light, daylight, above the moving average. And that was pretty much the whole system. And you look for a breakout above those two bars. If you Google the 220 EMA breakout system, you should be able to find it on the Stocks and Commodities website. So outside Landry Light, as we now call it, it's called, it was initially called daylight because one of the persons who read the articles dubbed it that and, and contacted me i thought that was kind of a cool thing but i decided to put my name on it <laughs> my wife why can't you put your name on things like bollinger's like okay baby i will 
But you can see that this little cool indicator down below is green when you have upside Landry light. And if the moving average intersects the price, it goes down to zero. Now, this does not measure the magnitude. It just measures the number of days that the mar market was green, meaning that you had upside Landry light, or the number of days the market was red, meaning that you had downside Landry light. Now, one thing in playing with this that I did discover is when this indicator peaks out or hits very high levels, meaning that the market's been green for a long, 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 long time. And there is a parameter in here where you could set this to around 50 or even 100 or so if you want. But when it hits these really extreme levels, especially about 100 or so on a weekly basis, this is a weekly chart, then it's the market is usually due for correction. Now, I wouldn't time off of this, but it's probably a good time to make sure you're taking partial profits. So if we take again, a look here, again, you can see that lows are greater than the moving average, so it's green. When the highs are less than the moving average, in this case, we're using just a 50 week simple moving average, it is red. So if we divide up the reds in the greens, for the most part, there is a tiny bit of red in that uptrend that we had from 2003 to 2008. But for the most part, it was green. In Tarzan speak, green, good. And red, bad. And as you can see, really nice trends occurred when you had red and when you had green. Now, all kidding aside, you should get excited looking at something like this because something as simple as Landry light can keep you on the right side of the market. Now, one other thing that I discovered is the longer a market is red, the more likely something bad will occur. So you don't necessarily want to jump out the market in a case like this, where it just turned red for a little period of time and then turned green again. But you certainly want to be cautious and make sure you're honoring your stops and maybe be a little bit more selective on the long side. So if we take a look at this longer term bull market we've been in going back to about 2011 for the most part we were mostly green and it looks like we just kind of went straight up now one thing to recognize is there were some pretty bad periods in between and sideways periods in between and so if you take a look at 2011 2012 this was a pretty choppy period it was not a good period to be a trend follower. It was one of those times where you really wanted to be out of the market, even though the market ultimately went up. But we didn't know that at the time. 2015, 2016 was another really bad time for trend following. But I think you have to, in fact, I know you have to be willing to get out the way when you see the market begin to turn like this. 2018, late 2018, December was one of the most recent examples that I could think of. I mean, other than obviously the slide we just had. And the reason that one sticks out is because in January, I remember renting a U-Haul to move. And the guy in the U-Haul place is like, he had, he had on CNBC. I know I've told the story a thousand times, but it, it's just interesting to me. And he's, he's like, yeah, I trade. And uh, I'm so glad I held on through, through December slide. And man, I wish I'd have bought more at the bottom. It's like, well, that'll work until it don't. And unfortunately, he probably experienced a, one of those it don't periods earlier this year. And you could see that these were pretty serious slides. And then the, obviously the 2020 slide was pretty serious where the market drops 30% peak to trough. So as you go back further and further in time, something is simple as the Landry light on a weekly basis using a 30 period EMA. And again, I've been playing around a lot with this 30 period EMA lately, easy for me to say, on multiple time frames down as, as low as a five minute chart. And it's pretty cool, especially when you combine it with the Landry light. And in upcoming shows, we'll pop out to the live charts and I'll walk you through some of these indicators and show you what they were saying and what they are saying. But anyway, as you can see, nice little trends, both up and down. And if you don't short, you certainly might want to pay attention to the downside signals as a signal to possibly pulling your horns 
a little bit, or at the least, honor your Now, a few years back, I was thinking about the basis, the whole basis of technical analysis. And the whole basis of technical analysis is if a market's at A and it's going to C and B is somewhere between, it's going to have to pass through B on its way to C. Now, for this example, let's just say that A is 10, B is 20, and C is 30. Well, if it's going to go from 10 to 30, it will have to pass through B along the way. Now, it's not as simple as always buying at B, although I do have an IPO pattern that does pretty much just that. But you're much better off looking to buy around B or on the downside, maybe looking to get out of the market around B if the trend appears to be ending and a new downtrend appears to be beginning. So let's say a market's at A and down here is C and this is the 2000 to 2003 bear market. And then let's go from that 2000 low to the peak in 2007 and then back down to the low of 2009. So somewhere in between those is B. The question is, where is B? Where would be a spot where you might want to think about getting out of the market? For an index, I think 10% is a pretty good number, a pretty good round number. And if a market is within 10% of its 50 week closing high, it's probably okay. And if it's more than 10% away from its 50 week closing high, it's probably in trouble. And as I've said quite a bit, what kind of shocked me was, and I'll talk about this again next week, but what kind of shocked me was that we received or we got this weekly signal before the daily signals actually began to kick in. And I thought that was pretty impressive in March. And that's what had me really kind of freaked out about this coronavirus might being the real thing and that the market was taking it seriously all of a sudden. So again, people often ask me for a line in the sand. It's, it's very difficult to give them the exact place. It's like where exactly will you turn bullish or where exactly will you turn bearish? And that's where I kind of came up with good and bad. But as long as you're above the buy line, which is included with the plug-in, the market is generally good. And if you're below the buy line, it is bad. So again, good above, bad below. So you go back and look at these major bull and bear cycles, and you can see that the buy line did a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. Now, the buy line is simply 10% of the 50-week closing high, but you can adjust those parameters to your liking and to other markets. So if you're trading a biotech stock, which moves around 10% in one afternoon, obviously you would have to use a much bigger parameter. Now, on the bottom of the chart, you'll notice the percent away from the closing high. And here are the parameters in this particular case. It would be 90% would be a 10% number. And you can see that it draws a line on the charts at 10%. So anything above Anything below, so anything below 10% is good, and anything above 10% is bad. So when this snapshot was taken, you could see the market was 21% away from its 50-week closing high. And look at this right here. Notice that it was over 50% at one point. So that means that if you just bought and held Obviously, in 2008 and 2009, you would have lost half of your holdings, as many people have painfully discovered, unfortunately. Okay, now I do have another indicator called Landry Volatility, and it's just the 50-day historical volatility. Now, volatility is kind of a cool thing because it can help you to know when a bottom is near in the market. The only thing is it's not quite a holy grail. And I've been doing a lot of presentations on volatility recently, if you go in and watch the Week in Chart shows. And I've pointed out that it's not really a holy grail, but it's kind of a cool thing. Unfortunately, it can be a bit of a rabbit hole, and you can end up on that holy grail hunt. But as you can see, as a general statement, volatility tends to peak 
when a market is nearing a low because of the panic is setting in. And as a general statement, volatility tends to dry up and flatten out as a market begins to peak because they, there becomes a little complacency in the market. Now, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to get deeply into volatility. But what I suggest you do is go in and watch the recent weekend charts for a lot more on volatility and how to use it with the overall market. Just be careful not to try to make a holy grail out of it. But this is a very useful indicator in here. I think you'll find over time, especially if you're looking to trade individual stocks, take a look at this volatility. And as a general statement, within reason, you want to be in a slightly more volatile stocks. And right now, everything's kind of volatile. The overall market is at 25. You could see earlier this year, the volatility was right around 10 or less than 10. And by the way, it, in kind of the utmost simplest terms, the volatility based on historical volatility is normalized for one year. I have 252 trading periods in the, in the formula, in case you're wondering. I know, you probably want to party with me. <laughs> But uh, anyway, if the market has an HV of 10%, all things constant, which is not true, and if the market was normally distributed, which is not true, but let's say back here it's about 10%, it would suggest that the market would be 10% higher or 10% lower a year from now. Well, back when it was up here around 70%, that would suggest the market, based on its last 50 days, would be 10% higher or 10% lower a year from now. Now, as you know, all things aren't constant with the market, and the market isn't normally distributed, but it can give you a good feel for things. So like right now, I have some little biotech stocks, have HV of like 100. I know that those stocks, given the 25, the 50-day reading of the market around 25, I know that those stocks are about four times more volatile than the overall market. So check this out. This is something very interesting. Here's the other thing, too. A good example would be a friend of mine's a scalper and he was really printing money back in April and all and then lately he's not making quite as much money. He's having a bit hard time making money and he's a little newer to scalping and he seems to have a knack for it. But the one thing I've been pointing out to him is that take a look at your volatility curve and notice that volatility is dropping way off. And I had a similar experience 20 something years ago when I was day trading the S&P futures really actively. And although I'm, I'm fairly active in them now. But anyway, back then it was a big contract and I did really well for a while and then I just started getting chewed up. And the reason I was getting chewed up was it was summertime and volatility had really dropped off. So we need to pay attention to this volatility. Volatility within reason is your friend. So check out those indicators. They are free. If you have any questions, you can reach me at DaveLander.com slash contact. If you want the slides from this show and all the other shows that I've done, go to DaveLander.com slash stock charts. And it'll also give you access to the articles or the article I mentioned earlier. And if you go to DaveLander.com slash archives, you can look at all these mystery charts that I've talked about in the past because the mystery charts come straight from my trading service. And then you'll also be able to look at the ebb and flow in the portfolio. My contact information, one more time, DaveLander.com slash contact. I hope everybody enjoys the indicators. I've been really excited about it. I've been playing with it a lot. In the upcoming shows, I'm going to walk you through some of the things that I do with them in real charts and use some real trades. And I think that you'll find that fascinating. At least I do. I know. I know. I'm a nerd. So thanks, everybody, for watching. And may the trend be with you. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.